Welcome to another episode of Insects for Fun, the informational entomology-based podcast that branches out into other fields. Speaking of, we're doing something very different today by talking about plants that eat insects. Before we start, though, I want to thank all the people who have recently rated and wrote reviews for the show. I just checked them recently and am thrilled that you supported the show by rating and writing in. I've noticed a large proportion have come from the U.S., so a special thanks goes to my U.S. listeners. Let's keep those ratings and reviews coming. All right, so today we're looking at a special group of plants called carnivorous plants, and there are many kinds of these spread through the world, eating both arthropods and sometimes even small mammals or birds. There's currently an estimated 700 species of carnivorous plants in the world, and surprisingly, the greatest diversity does not come from the tropics. It's actually Australia, which boasts a crazy 250 species. Plants need to have five traits to be considered carnivorous. One, they capture prey. Two, they kill the prey. Three, they digest the prey. Four, they absorb nutrients from their prey. And five, they rely on those nutrients to grow. So how did this even start in the first place? Plants should only need water and light, right? Apparently not. You see, carnivory and plants actually evolved multiple times in different lineages, which means they are not all from a common ancestor, and thus the need to rely on nutrients from living things became a necessity from their environment. The oldest dated carnivorous plant actually came into existence 85.6 million years ago, which is long, long after arthropods and insects made their debut. This checks out, because how on earth could there be a carnivorous plant when small arthropods had yet to make the scene? Also, the environment in the very early times was ripe with nutrients for plants, which you'll soon learn is not ideal for the evolution of carnivory. Another interesting fact is that carnivorous plants are mostly herbs. But what does that even mean? Because we certainly aren't eating them. Herb means that the plant does not have a woody stem and dies back to ground level in cold or rough conditions. These plants usually have a strong fragrance to them as well. So, what environmental conditions cause this kind of evolution? Carnivorous plants seem to thrive in conditions that have a lot of light, waterlogged soil, and a lack of nutrients, like nitrates and phosphorus in the soil. Without a need for large leaves to absorb light and a large supply of water, these plants began evolving new strategies to get the nutrients they need. And this is exactly how carnivorous plants were born. Some evolutionary theorists believe that carnivory in plants is a last resort tactic only when conditions are not optimal for any other form of survival. In the wild, these plants are actually quite rare, but they can be found more commonly in bogs and other difficult landscapes for normal plants. They're pretty poor competitors and really only thrive where other plants fail. In fact, some of them actually give up carnivory temporarily when light is limited or the soil gains more nutrients. Saracenia species, which are trumpet pitcher plants, produce flat non-carnivorous leaves in winter and lose their insect-catching pitchers. It actually takes a lot of resources to produce pitchers with their hairs, sticky substances, and aromatic glands. These accessories don't guarantee a catch either so it's actually better to not produce them if conditions allow for a more normal plant structure. In general, there are five kinds of mechanisms that carnivorous plants use to ensnare and digest their food. These would be pitfall traps, sticky traps, snap traps, bladder traps, and lobster traps, although some plants use a combination. Pitfall traps are perhaps the most iconic of all carnivorous plants, and they come in many different forms. You might recognize them from pitcher plants or even the carnivorous bromeliad, Brachinia reducta. Also, think about the Pokemon Victory Bell. This guy was designed off a pitcher plant. These traps are essentially a cauldron or tube filled with digestive fluid, and they're open at the top. The sides of these plants are often waxy and slippery, making it nearly impossible for prey to escape once they fall in. Imagine an insect being lured by the sweet smell of nectar at the mouth of the plant. As it climbs up, it suddenly slips and falls into the tube, where it's met with digestive juices at the bottom, turning it into a nutritious soup. 
Some species, like Saracenia pitcher plants, have a special hood or operculum that covers the top of the trap. This acts like an umbrella, keeping rainwater out so it doesn't dilute the digestive juice. Others, like Heliamphora, have evolved a small opening along the sides of the plant to act as an overflow drain, managing any excess water that may come in from rain. Interestingly, smaller pitcher plants have even adapted to attract small mammals, not just for the animals themselves, but for their droppings. These animals are positioned in such a way that they defecate directly into the trap, and the plants honestly look like miniature toilets. And before you ask why would a plant need droppings, they do provide nutrients that the plant needs, like nitrates. Next up would be the flypaper or sticky trap plants. These traps use a glue-like substance that acts just like, well, you guessed it, flypaper. The plant's leaves secrete this sticky mucilage through glands that stud the surface. You'll find this type of trap in plants like pinguicula or butterworts, and drosera, or sundews. When an insect lands on the sticky surface, it's not going anywhere. Some plants, like butterworts, take a step further by rolling their leaves over the prey, trapping it even more securely. Others, like the sundews, have long sticky hairs that curl around the insect once it touches them, creating a little cell where the digestive process can't begin. Now let's talk about snap traps one of the most dramatic types of carnivorous plant traps. The Venus flytrap, Dionea musipula, is the star here, along with the waterwheel plant, Aldravanda vesiculosa. The waterwheel plant is the aquatic variant of the Venus flytrap. Its traps are much smaller, but they also close much faster than that of the Venus, and they rely on small aquatic life like tadpoles, tiny fish, and insect naiads or nymphs. These traps work by responding to touch, when an insect brushes against two trigger hairs inside the trap, within 20 seconds the trap will snap shut, forming a tight seal. This seal prevents the prey from escaping and allows the plant to fill the trap with digestive fluid to break it down. Snap traps require a lot of energy to operate, so they've evolved to be very selective. The trap won't close unless the trigger hairs are touched in quick succession, ensuring that it's really an insect or small animal causing the disturbance and not just rain or a gust of wind. Second to last, we've got these suction or bladder traps, which are unique to the bladderwort genus, Utricularia. These plants are aquatic or semi-terrestrial, and their traps work like tiny vacuums. These plants can actually suck in insects with up to 60 g-force, which is whack, considering astronauts go up into space at a modest 4 g's. The bladder traps are small sacs along the plant's stem that create a low-pressure vacuum by pumping out ions. When an unsuspecting insect or aquatic creature touches the trigger hairs or opening, the vacuum is released, sucking the prey in. And once inside, there's no escape, and the plant can begin digesting its meal. Last but not least, we've got the lobster pot traps. These traps, like the real lobster traps used in the ocean, are easy to enter but impossible to escape from. They're usually constructed from Y-shaped leaves that create a chamber easy to enter, where the insect then gets snared and usually falls into a pit with digestive juices. Prey that enters these traps often heads towards the lower arm of the Y, where they sense water movement, but this only leads them closer to the digestive fluid at the bottom. You'll find this trap type in Genlisia species, also known as corkscrew plants, which grow in wet or semi-aquatic environments. I think lobster pot plants are also sometimes referred to as cobra plants because the Y-shaped leaves and curved head of the plant look like a cobra. Not all insects are doomed to carnivorous plants though. In fact, some of them have formed a special symbiotic relationship with them. For example, a species of ant named Camponatus schmitzi have found a forever home in Bornean pitcher plants, Nepenthes bicalcarata. The ants are able to walk across the slippery pitcher traps, swim, and even dive in the plant's digestive fluids. They also consume nectar and prey that falls into the traps as well. The ants are given a safe place to live while providing the plants with a cleanup crew and source of nitrogen from ant droppings. The ants don't just keep the plant surface clean either. They actually help the plants by devouring all the mosquito larvae that end up occupying the pitcher's fluids and could potentially take over the plant's insides if left unchecked. This is not the only case in which insects and carnivorous plants get together. 
In Australia, there are sundew bugs, specifically named for their affinity to carnivorous sundew plants. And these true bugs walk across the usually detrimental sticky surface of sundews and feed on the carcasses of insects that got trapped. The bugs provide a service to the plant by giving them an extra boost to their digestive cycle and providing extra nitrogen from their droppings. That's not even including the protection these bugs offer to other pests that could potentially try and feed on the plant itself. We've mentioned before that predatory bugs are actually helpful on plants because they're targeting soft-bodied pests like caterpillars or other true bugs that are plant sap feeders. Now, if you find yourself intrigued and wish to own your very own carnivorous plant, it is totally possible. There are many places where you can purchase live plants or even get the seeds to grow your own carnivorous plants. Thankfully, many websites even break down what plants are best for the continent or climate you live on. I've had Venus flytraps myself in the past and found them to be pretty straightforward and easy to care for. Just remember, if you want your carnivorous plants to remain carnivorous, you shouldn't pump their soil with fertilizer. And that's going to wrap up today's episode on carnivorous plants. I hope you all learned something new. And as always, make sure to rate and review this podcast. Let's keep the rankings up. The best way to support the show also is to head over to patreon.com forward slash insects for fun, where I drop a lot of vlogs, post monthly bonus episodes, and of course, grant access to ad free episodes. And thank you again for listening.